Okay, so this panel is about national, state, and local programming, and our panelists will share successful implementation stories and examples. So our guests are Matt Thompson from YMCA of the USA, Chris Moore from U.S. Youth Soccer, David McCann from the University of Illinois Department of Recreation, Sports, and Tourism, and then Jennifer Cartland and Charlie Sperduta from Washington Nationals Youth Baseball Academy. Good afternoon. That was a decent response, so. <laughs> All right, the future of the nation's health and well-being depends on our commitment and investment in physical activity, sports, and recreation. The Y has spent 175 years, that's right, 175 years, focused on developing programs that build healthy spirit, mind, and body for all. This year is actually our 175th year birthday. We'll be celebrating that in London, England, where we started uh, back in 1844 by George Williams. My name is Matt Thompson. I'm an executive director at a large YMCA in the Gateway Region uh, YMCA Association in St. Louis. I have partnered with a host of the groups that have presented today and share so many thoughts and messages already delivered. We were asked to share our organization's unique contributions to this space and offer recommendations to government. It's hard to do that in 15 minutes, but I'll try. All right, a little bit about our history. If you didn't know this, the history of the Y is ingrained in the history of the United States. Thank you to Maureen for sharing the history of the Y within you sports earlier today. Um, an interesting point, muscular Christianity, which Maureen mentioned, is essentially the start of CrossFit. <laughs> Sports and recreation are in the YMCA's DNA, founded as a safe place for young men during the Industrial Revolution. The Y has always seen fitness, sports, and recreation as a way to build a sense of relationship and belonging. James Naismith invented basketball as a sport to be played in New England during cold weather months. Something you may not know, and this is more on the innovation front of, of basketball, is that it actually took them a couple years to figure out they needed to cut a hole in the bottom of the peach basket. That's where we like to describe the first initial fast breaks started to, to happen within basketball. Group swimming lessons were developed and taught to build confidence and safety skills and sports have always been a way to build leadership and teamwork skills. Sports also provides opportunities for volunteers to serve as mentors, coaches, and officials. Sports and recreation was a source for mental health and recovery as the Y brought 4,000 huts for recreation and religious services overseas during World War I. During World War II, the Y secretly brought sports, clubs, and recreation onto internment camps for Japanese Americans. In the 1970s, the Y and the NBA Players Association created the Youth Basketball Association, or YBA, to organize youth into recreational sports programs that stress skills and teamwork over winning at any cost. A little bit about our reach. So we flash forward to today. Our nation's physical footprint really caused our leaders to step up and do more to improve the community's health. 80% of U.S. households live within five miles of a YMCA. It's a pretty impressive stat. 51% of YMCAs serve a lower socioeconomic uh, area or community. We serve over 9 million kids in the United States. We have spent the last two decades intentionally focused on the prevention and control of chronic diseases through a variety of strategies, policies, and program. Youth sports and play are one critical component. Our network and infrastructure enables us to serve over one million kids through youth sports programs and serve as the nation's swim instructor, reaching over one million youth with swim lessons each year. 
We also serve millions of adults through fitness, sports, aquatics, and chronic disease programming. We know that healthy parents help serve as role models for their kids. A little bit about local, because I, as mentioned, house out of St. Louis. And so just to give a little reach about the work we're doing in the Gateway Region Y. In my YMCA, to give you that local perspective, we have 24 traditional branch locations and more than 120 program sites covering St. Louis City, seven Missouri counties, and six counties in Southwest Illinois. We serve over 250,000 people in our Y and its related branches and reach over 18,000 youth through youth sports and 21,000 youth through swimming lessons. Missouri's YMCA's serve over 600,000 Missourians as participants and members. Our YMCA's employ over 10,000 Missourians. So a little bit about our mindset and the seven pillars that make up YMCA youth sports. Now these pillars can look different depending upon the YMCA that you're at, because as we like to say in the Y, when you've seen one Y, you have seen one Y. So first, everyone plays. Positive competition and family involvement are a part of our seven pillars. In an age where many parents are pushing kids into sports specialization, and competitive sports are starting for as young as first graders, as I've seen, the Y holds a key place in keeping sports in perspective. It was shared earlier that the average cost for one child in one sport by Dan is $400. At the Y, we offer financial assistance so no one is turned away due to an inability to pay. You may also hear people say they don't agree with the concept of everyone gets an award or a trophy. We disagree with this, as many of the kids we serve may come from an environment in which they are not praised or come from an environment in which they do not have positive role models. Our role with developing youth is to help them reach their full potential and positive reinforcement, even through a trophy, can possibly change the trajectory of a child that is off course. Finally, I mentioned uh, family involvement is a pillar. And Dan mentioned earlier too, the benefits of youth sports exist when there is a caring and quality coach we focus on incorporating our core values of caring, honesty, respect and responsibility, as well as developmental assets into our programs. So a little bit about the unique contributions to youth sports. When it comes to everyone playing, the Y recognized that as the leading provider of childcare and after school programming, that we could change policies and standards that would uh, up the ante in terms of time children engaged in physical activity. This is especially important as schools have more pressure on them and are cutting back physical education programming. Our healthy eating and physical activity standards, also known as HEPA, have been adopted and are being implemented by almost all of our YMCAs. HEPA requires certain amounts of physical activity for the kids depending upon how long we have them in our care. We need to recognize the critical role that out of school time can play in the social and emotional development of our kids and that these spaces and places offer opportunities for youth sports and play. This includes structured and unstructured play. Essentially, whenever we have the kids, we need to ensure they are outside and being active. To encourage the healthy development of youth and to ensure all kids and parents are aware of their opportunities for sports and play, YMCA has conducted the first National Healthy Kids Day in 1992, the nation's largest health day for kids and families. Free and open to the public, it became an annual April event designed to emphasize the importance of play and keeping kids healthy and happy and enhancing their problem-solving abilities, creativity, and social and motor skills. Summer needs to be a time of health and well-being, but in many ways it had become a time where kids fell behind and gained weight. 
Now Healthy Kids Day for the Y is more of a kickoff and celebration of summertime and youth development. And kids and families learn about and gain access to youth sports, play, camp, and recreation, and can also learn how to get help if they're struggling with food insecurity, achievement gap, and more. Another topic which we believe to be extraordinarily important, and we've touched on it just a little bit today, um, is child safety. <clears throat> so safety first at the Y. The Y has spent the last two decades deeply focused on strategies to ensure children are safe from those that may intend to harm them. We built the strongest internal mechanism and strict pr child protection policies and multifaceted staff screening procedures, but it wasn't enough. Too many organizations serving youth lacked access to FBI fingerprint-based background checks. We needed this tool in our toolbox to fully protect our children. I am delighted to share that the Y, together with other leading youth-serving organizations, passed the Child Protection Improvements Act last year to more fully protect our children. In addition to this, the YMCA has recently adopted, we had 10 membership um, requirements for you being a YMCA, we recently adopted an 11th, and that is our Child Protection and Aquatic Safety Guidelines. And so every YMCA in the country, if you want to be a YMCA, must adhere to that standard and that policy. <clears throat> Water safety skills for all, because as we know, one drowning is too many drownings. If we want kids involved in water sports and play, we have to ensure they are safe around water and provided with swim instruction. Sadly, 60% of African American kids and 48% of Hispanic kids cannot swim. This is compared to 40% of Caucasian kids that cannot swim. So it might not surprise you to learn that drowning is now the leading cause of accidental death among children aged zero to four. And it's also the second leading cause of all deaths for kids up to 14 years of age. Just let that sink in for a minute. The Y has been on a mission to ensure kids are safe around water for the last several years. Today, 1,250 Ys offer the Safety Around Water Drowning Prevention Course, and we are partnering with Red Cross, Parks and Recs, and the American Academy of Pediatricians to do much more. The Y is also fighting for a drowning prevention program at the CDC. 25%, this is a slide I'm very proud of because I've done this work in a multitude of cities, 25% of Ys report some type of partnership with Special Olympics athletes and programs. Nationally, we are a member of the Special Olympics National Inclusion Health Movement. Local Ys partner with national disability organizations, such as those listed here, to support inclusive environments where all youth can participate no matter their ability. In 2018, the Y hosted an inaugural inclusion summit focusing on diverse abilities and developing inclusion practices for individuals with diverse abilities, covering a host of topics, including sports. YMCA of the USA, the National Resource Office for the 2700 Ys in this country, collects and tracks data on a host of Y programming services every single year. This is a little small, but you can kind of see uh, the sampling of youth sports offerings at YMCA's. You can see the number of Ys offering a host of youth sports and what percentage that is of our Y movement. So you'll see that youth basketball and youth soccer is the most popular with competitive swimming, flag football, and t-ball not far behind. We track volunteers, facilities, and much, much more. The Y has 600,000 volunteers for an array of Y programming. With regard to youth sports, we have a variety of marketing, promotional, and training materials to help understand the benefits of volunteering and coaching. We also utilize storytelling and testimonials to help encourage others to volunteer. 
In addition, we connect leadership competencies needed in the workplace for young leaders to youth sports coaching. There are so many opportunities to develop leaders by giving back to their community. So making that connection of the benefit within business to the benefit and knowledge gained through coaching. So our recommendations, we have just a couple. So dig into these a little bit. We believe it's essential that the federal government invest in a drowning prevention program at the CDC and work with national organizations like the YMCA to teach kids water safety and how to swim so they can have a lifetime of water-based physical activity and sport. Coupled with this is a very important piece of parent education because we know also that parents that do not know how to swim, those kids are less likely and are at more danger of drowning. We are working with the federal government to fully implement the Child Protection Improvement Act to keep our kids safe from harm. So we'd like to see that um, pushed through very quickly. We also support the federal investment in volunteer programs and believe the government could try to leverage those for youth sports. This could be in recruitment, but also in training, as we've mentioned uh, from some other folks today. Many of our Ys give their staff paid time off to volunteer. The federal government could role model that if they don't already and encourage other employers to do the same. Currently, the CDC um, is only able to fund uh, about 15, actually, not about, 15 states for nutrition, physical activity, and obesity prevention programs. All states should have funding to advance physical activity and sports um, and prevent obesity. After school programs uh, provide great opportunities for play and physical activity and social emotional well-being. The federal government needs to continue to make a strong investment in the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program. Finally, let's not forget that awe and inspiration that outdoor play and physical activity can have on young people. The Y partners with the National Park Service on youth programs giving underserved kids their first outdoor play, service, and leadership opportunities. So we want to ensure that that is at the forefront. To conclude, the Y has been around for 175 years. I think we're going to be around for another 175 years. We're in over 10,000 communities. We have been involved in sports for almost as long as sports have existed. And our reach is extensive making the Y a premier place to positively impact our nation via youth sports, especially our ability to scale programs nationally. Thank you so much for your time today. Good afternoon, and like they say, um, the worst time to be a presenter is right before lunch and right before the end. So, <laughs> um, nevertheless, I'm happy to be here uh, uh, with you this afternoon. My name is Chris Moore, and I am the CEO of US Youth Soccer. And on behalf of our board, our membership, and our staff, I want to thank, um, uh, thank uh, the President's Council on Sports, Nutrition, and Fitness, and H HHS for um, uh, having us participate today. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, our organization. I've certainly learned a lot here today. I took the, one of the first things I wrote down was, what, so what, and now what? I, that is my, going to be my mantra uh, going forward. Let me tell you a little bit about us first, and then, um, as the prior speakers have done, I will um, uh, you know, share some of the strategies that we employ to drive participation through our sport and then provide some recommendations. Uh, hopefully that uh, could potentially be adopted as, um, as um, the, the organizations uh, collectively work to craft a, a national strategy for youth sports. We were founded 
1974. U.S. Youth Soccer is the largest youth sport organization uh, in the country. We're not as, um, as, haven't been around as long as the YMCA, but we do have the reach and the, the footprint um, in that we have 55 uh, diverse, autonomous member state associations across the country. Uh, and they ladder, uh, under them are 10,000 leagues and clubs. Uh, we also have two affiliate members as well. By every objective measure, measure, U.S. Youth Soccer is the runaway leader in youth, uh, youth soccer and um, one could argue in uh, youth sports by, by virtue of our size. So we like to start, as everyone does now, uh, with our why. You know, why do we exist? Uh, well, it's, it's quite simple. It's to transform the lives of America's youth through the game of soccer. Period. Um, so what does that mean? Fundamentally, we believe that soccer has um, transformative uh, powers that provides um, uh, kids with an opportunity to develop and to grow. And as a part of that, U.S. Youth Soccer offers uh, programs, pathways, and access to allow kids the opportunity to develop and, and grow and have fun. Um, learn, develop life lessons, um, be they uh, you know, um, physical, social, and emotional benefits as well. And our mission is to make soccer the preeminent youth sport in the United States. Um, and that involves certainly uh, participation growth among uh, youth at, uh, of all backgrounds, abilities, and experience. Um, uh, that also involves uh, um, the degree to which we impact coaches and referees and um, administrators and volunteers, parents. Um, it truly takes a village to operate uh, the, the organization and the, the, the industry that we're part of. And our vision is to be the future of soccer and to provide a pathway for every player, irrespective of, of you know, age, gender, level of play, and, and such. Our, our key priorities are, you know, obviously we're, we're a membership organization, a national membership driven uh, organization. We're, we're um, at the national perch, but then we have 55 member state associations under us, two affiliate members, as I noted earlier, and then um, thousands of clubs and leagues and teams across the country. So we operate very much in this, this vertical, but then also um, we uh, work very cooperatively and collaboratively with our national governing body, who is uh, United States Soccer Federation, um, and then we're also forging alliances and partnerships with the um, Major League Soccer, the MLS, and other organizations uh, to help unify, really, the industry. As some have noted earlier today, uh, youth sports in general and soccer in particular um, are, are very uh, uh, fragmented, and so we're trying as best we can to work uh, within the industry to, to achieve uh, many of these things. And before I leave this slide, I think it's important to note, because Paul raised it earlier and some other folks, um, about many of these organizations staying in their lanes and focusing, in the case of soccer, on competitive soccer. We view our role as much bigger than the sport that we're overseeing. We, obviously we have uh, to run programs, events, competitions, but we view our role and our responsibility uh, in, a, in a way that's more solemn and, and sacred than that. And that is we are touching the lives of three million children each and every day through our programs. And we don't take that lightly. So. Um, uh, so we do, we, we do more than just competitive soccer. We're developing youth um, to be uh, pr uh, uh, healthy and high achieving and productive uh, adults. Now with that being said, let me um, just take you through some of our programs. Um, U.S. Youth Soccer provides programs for youth soccer players of all ages and backgrounds. Um, some of the most notable programs that we offer are the uh, number one, U.S. Youth Soccer National League, which is the top league uh, in America with the top teams of, uh, competing across the country. Um, our national championship series, we refer to it as our crown jewel, the most pre prestigious 
national championships in the country. It starts with 10,000 teams from across the country at the state level um, competing to uh, uh, go on to, you know, to punch their ticket to regional championships and then on to the national level where we uh, see the top 96 teams out of that, you know, base of 10,000. So it's, it's very much um, a, a prestigious event for us and te uh, teams from players from across the country work uh, to, uh, to be part of that. And um, we also offer the, through our partnership with Target, the largest recreational soccer tournament in the country called the Target United Cup. It's very much an experiential program uh, that engages and activates uh, recreational kids from across the country. And uh, it, we, it's provided at no cost uh, in, in various communities. And it's really an amped up, it enhanced experience that not only involves Target, the brand, but also many of their vendor partners. And we just deliver a, a meaningful experience to kids in communities across the country. We offer uh, Top Soccer, uh, which is a community-based uh, training and team placement uh, program for youth athletes with disabilities. Soccer Across America is our platform that targets kids from um, uh, from particularly in urban communities and underserved populations where there aren't safe places to play and we want to bring the game uh, to as many of those communities as we can. Uh, one um, a program that's not here is our ODP program, Olympic Development Program, uh, which identifies and trains players from the local communities along each step of the process from state to regional <coughs> um, to national levels and ultimately culminating uh, with the U.S. men's or uh, women's national team. And then finally on this slide, um, we call it AIMS, U.S. Youth Soccer Athlete Incident Management System. It's a mobile, real-time injury reporting tracking tool um, that uh, helps us uh, manage return to play um, and, and, and also enables us to adhere to state and federal laws uh, regarding training uh, and, and mandatory reporting uh, and we provide this tool with uh, at no cost to our members and you know we can talk a lot about the programming that we offer uh, the competitive programming or the recreational program but I uh, humbly believe that our most um, important duty is keeping kids safe while we have them in our in our midst and that and AIMS is one of the programs that uh, we use to do that so here's a framework that I don't have a lot of words, uh, uh, but I'm going to just talk you through this, uh, that we envision utilizing for a potential partnership and, and, and uh, collabor collaboration is, is, is the first. We think it's critical and that it allows us to leverage our collective strengths with like-minded organizations uh, to make a collective impact, as we've talked about earlier. So we, I talked about our partnership with Injure Free and, and um, another partner that we uh, work with in the delivery of AIMS is the Mayo Clinic. We have a partnership with U.S. Center for Safe Sport, Target, Dick Sporting Goods, and many other organizations. And collaboration within the public and private sectors um, is, is certainly key. Um, we partner with uh, Hyundai Hope on Wheels uh, to uh, raise awareness of pediatric cancer, which inflicts, uh, afflicts so many uh, children. So we, again, we view ourselves as much bigger than the sport that we administer every day, and, and collaboration is a big part of that. We uh, have worked uh, uh, with many other organizations like Parks and Recs and you know, uh, con uh, you know, uh, convention bureaus uh, from across the country as we take our events on the road uh, to many cities and communities across the country. We're partners with the Aspen Institute's Project uh, Play and many, many others. So collaboration is, is key and we would obviously welcome to, uh, welcome uh, partnering with government agencies to help um, develop solutions uh, for national youth uh, strategies as well. Um, Key success indicators, which again, that, that's, that's been noted earlier today as being critical. We believe it's important in uh, maintaining long-term viability and sustainability as we look to um, provide access, uh, uh, awareness, and then uh, stem the tide of, of attrition as, as we want 
to retain as many kids in uh, youth sports uh, as, as we can. Positioning, um, both you know, in terms of physical space, but also th the broader environment, ensuring that we offer the best programs and initiatives that are demanded by uh, the, state, uh, the, the stakeholder groups and that those programs are in the right um, locations and in the right formats that, um, that our members uh, want them to be in. I talked about our top, top soccer program, which again, there's a need for uh, in communities across the country. Many of our clubs are implementing our top soccer program. Our national championship series, which again starts at the state level and goes all the way up to the national level. National League and so many others. So before I end, I, I just want to, I don't have slides for these, but I'm going to just take you through um, a couple of examples of, of strategies that we uh, are actively uh, implementing. And, um, and then the, the question then becomes, what are some recommendations for, uh, a, for the federal government to, to you know, partner with us? It's a good question, and I'm glad you guys asked. Um, so let's start with awareness. It's been talked about a lot um, uh, today. And I, I like to, you know, U.S. Youth Soccer has many um, strategies aimed at driving awareness, you know, through our marketing and communications initiatives. Uh, we utilize our, um, you know, our social media, um, uh, you know, community, oh, um, digital, uh, we promote via website. There's so many things we do to tell our story and to tell the story of the broader uh, industry. And what we're doing, we're evolving many of our messages to talk about the benefits, the, the physical benefits of participation, uh, the, the social and emotional benefits that the uh, sport of soccer delivers, and many others. And I hearken back to the, the some of the startling statistics that we hear about when it comes to screen time and the amount of time that kids, uh, the technology companies spend engaging kids. So if you consider that a little more than a decade ago, uh, kids spent an average of six and a quarter hours per week uh, on some form, some form of a screen, whether it was a handheld um, you know, smartphone, uh, you know, play, uh, PlayStation 4, Sony PlayStation 4, Xbox, you name it, a website, a television, uh, some form of technology. Today, it's more than 11 hours per week, uh, with teens spending upwards of five hours a day on social media. And I have a soon-to-be 15-year-old, and I think the five uh, hours a day may be a little um, uh, conservative. Um, and then middle, middle schoolers and tweens spend roughly 45 hours per week on screens, which amounts to more than a full-time job. So the, the reason I bring that up is that technology, instead of uh, putting it down, it can actually be an enabler if it's used the right way. And I think that's a huge opportunity for us to collectively drive awareness. Um, it goes back to that adage, fish where the fish are. Um, technology is not going to go away. In fact, it's probably going to get, get um, ramped up even more. So there's an opportunity, I believe, to drive awareness using technology. And U.S. Youth Soccer is doing that. And we think um, we would love to partner with many of you here in the room on that as well. The second area is promoting private and, and, um, and public partnership, uh, partnerships. Um, you talked about that earlier, uh, Paul, today. Um, USU Soccer offers grants through our Soccer Across America program to clubs to help offset direct costs so that children can participate for free. We provide our top soccer program for children who have physical and emotional disabilities. Um, we offer the Target United Cup uh, um, in communities across the country that I mentioned. Um, and again, it's all about getting more kids in the funnel, getting them more physically active, and we want to remove as many barriers as, uh, to participation as we, we can. And, um, and, and what's more, we have a, a network, a footprint of 55 member state associations across the country, and we can deploy resources uh, at, at scale. Uh, so those are two of the more prominent ones. And then the last, um, the last area, I believe, is around metrics. 
uh, U.S. Youth Soccer and our state associations, we currently track many data points on participation, but we would uh, welcome the opportunity to work with uh, you guys as we build out a new member data center uh, later this, uh, it'll be rolled out later this fall, but there's an opportunity for us to partner together um, uh, to better identify who's playing youth sports in the country and how we can reach and engage them. So with that, I appreciate it. Thank you so much again for having us here and, um, and uh, we look forward to being part of the solution. Always remember to hydrate. So, um, we ready to roll? Okay. Uh, my name is David McCann. I'm director of the Office of uh, Recreation and Park Resources at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, we're part of the Department of uh, Tourism, uh, Recreation, Sport, and Tourism. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, HHS and the President's Council for allowing me to uh, to come here today and uh, share with you some of the activities that we've been doing and some of the initiatives that we've been undertaking at uh, Illinois uh, for the state of Illinois. Um, if we can see, where's my little clicker here? Okay. So, um, first of all, I've been in this for about 25 years and uh, worked with a lot of really interesting, fantastic organizations in, in sports in the United States and around the world. Uh, I've been uh, involved in uh, youth sport coaching, youth sport programming, coaches education, um, elite performance development, and sports organization structure and strategy. And I can tell you firsthand that uh, sports in America is chaotic. The landscape is, is just, you know, littered, cluttered. There's really no organization. And it makes it really hard for those of us working there to, to really make best use of our resources. And when I've talked with uh, people from other countries, they, they tell me, wow, you're, you're you know, so rich, so powerful in the United States. You have so many things going for you. And, you know, you, you must... It must be perfect. And I tell them it would be if we were all kind of working together. And the problem is, and, and you know, I think everybody here appreciates that, we're not working together because there's really no structure to work for and uh, work under. So, um, you know, I'd like to, as I conclude my uh, presentation, I'll touch on that. So, uh, Dan and Mo uh, basically made this slide irrelevant earlier today. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, uh, what we're here talking about today is not new. It was started by uh, the Eisenhower administration uh, back in the 50s, continued with uh, Kennedy and Johnson and the Gavin Report in the 60s. There was the President's Commission on Olympic Sports in the 70s that resulted in the 1978 Amateur Sports Act. And then, you know, subsequent to that, there have been other uh, studies, you know, I guess the, the most... Uh, um, uh, noteworthy uh, was just earlier this year the Ropes and Gray report on the USOC and the NAS, NAS, Nasser uh, issue. So it's a it's it's a pretty extensive subject and it's been studied for a while. It's hard to define. Like we don't even know what age group we're talking about in some cases. Uh, you know, is it uh, three to to twelve? Is it uh, four to eighteen? Is is it lifelong? And, uh, and what's the problem that we're all concerned about? Is it participation? Is it the fact that the United States is number one in childhood obesity uh, you know, around the world? Is it the cost of being involved in sports? Is it uh, the, the fact that it's $15 billion now? It's, it's a major industry out there. Are, are the participants and the consumers of youth sport, are they set being satisfied? Are their needs being met? Are they being kept safe? Uh, you know, we talk about injuries, we talk about concussions. Now, you know, we're dealing with molestation problems. I mean, are we really looking after the well-being of, of the youth out there that are part of this system? And are we, are we really inclusive? Because, you know, there's a, a good argument to be made that, you know, sports is more exclusionary than most people think in terms of you know, uh, re uh, income levels, in terms of location. We talk about uh, you know, the problems with urban 
uh, inner city sports, uh, there's a real problem with rural sports. They don't have the facilities and the services often uh, that you might think. So there's a lot of different problems that we have to deal with. And um, these are issues and problems that the researchers at the University of Illinois uh, were asking themselves back in 2014, 2015. Um, the, uh, the professors in uh, sport development at Illinois um, thought that they needed to, you know, as, as the state university, they needed to provide a service and look at what was going on in Illinois and how could they improve youth sport in Illinois. And so uh, they pretty much did what you're doing here. Um, they uh, created a summit. Uh, we had a two-day summit at Navy Pier uh, in uh, September of 2015. And we brought together about five dozen uh, stakeholders in youth sports from around the, uh, around the state. They were uh, uh, park and rec people, youth sport people, academics. Um, I got to speak on long-term athlete development. We had um, Tom Ferry from Project Play. I think he just introduced the, uh, the playbook. So we had a lot of uh, great discussion. It was a two-day event, and a lot was done. The result of that was a white paper called Reinventing Sport in Illinois. And these were the, the six pillars, uh, columns, whatever you want to call it, uh, that they, uh, they identified as being key elements to making sport better in, in the state. And uh, you know, take a look at those, and one will probably pop out, and I'll be going into more depth about. And so, you know, strategy is great. You know, books are, you know, you, you, I think everybody has a bookcase full of strategic plans, and, uh, and, and that's nice. But if you don't implement, if you don't have programs, if you can't put boots on the ground and really make things happen, you're wasting your time. And so I was brought into the, uh, into the program to pretty much implement a lot of the uh, ideas and recommendations of that white paper. And you can see that we've developed kind of a strategy. This is a hit list of, of projects I have. Um, I call it job security. So. Um, and you'll see the first one is online sport, uh, sport family education resources and modules. And that's the one I'm going to stress today uh, because I only have 15 minutes. So we wanted to uh, reach out to the parents who we identified as the key, um, key stakeholders in youth sport because uh, parents decide where their children are playing. I mean, who's, who's, who has a child under 10 years old? Okay, um, you know, you're pretty much going to be making the decisions on where they're going to play and how much you're going to pay for them to play. So uh, we are focusing on sport parents, the sport family, the, uh, the guardians, the caregivers, and we're developing educational resources for them. And all of our educational resources are going to be evidence-based. And you can see here, this is a, 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 actually a PhD thesis. Uh, that was just approved two weeks ago, and I should put a doctor in front of uh, Edward Horn's name because uh, his, he successfully uh, defended his dissertation, and uh, he'll be receiving his PhD next month. So this identified the role of parents and coaches in supporting athlete develop at their athlete development. And so, you know, parents, it, it, this is a synopsis of what he came up with in other research, and, you know, parents are the key decision maker but they need to be educated on some of the basic aspects of athletic and youth development, because they're not. Um, who here has taken a sport parent course? Really? OK. Very good. And, uh, but, you know, but it's not something that parents you know, usually think about taking, right? They, they just sort of figure that they, they, they know enough about it. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, you know, they need to know that it's, it's about the long-term focus of the, the child. It's not about who wins the championship, you know, next week or next month. And uh, they need to learn how to work with coaches. They need to learn how to become coaches. Because I'd say pretty much 80, 90% of your youth sport coaches are parents at some point. And that's how they get involved. And, uh, and then I had to add optimal push theory, which is uh, the creation of uh, Dr. Gould's. And it's basically they need to know how much to support and when to back off um, supporting their child's uh, development. 
So we identified uh, parents as kind of the tip of the spear out there. They were the critical uh, stakeholder in, in really improving youth sport in Illinois. And what do they need to know? This is just sort of the first 10 topic areas that we identified. And when I say the first 10, it's going to grow you know, substantially. Things like physical literacy, things like free play, uh, the benefits of free play and how it benefits creativity later on. You know, multi-sport participation, how to work with coaches, relative age, maturity, development, um, developmentally appropriate games, gender inclusiveness, inclusiveness, you know, across the board. So there's a ton of topics that we've got out there that we need to address that we think parents should know. So how do we get that information um, to parents? Well, what we're going to be doing is working with the park districts in Illinois as our first partner. We have 304 park districts in Illinois. And um, there we want them to be kind of the, uh, the conduit for this information out to the, the, uh, the areas throughout the state. And so we're reaching out to them. And this is a, a video that I think we can show that sort of tries to tell um, and inform the park district people that um, how in their role and how important they are in uh, in dealing with park district in dealing with youth sport development. And if Kyle gets it, clicks it, there we Welcome go. To the Illinois Sport Development Initiative, we'd like to share with you some exciting new insights into elite sport development and the value of park district and grassroots community sport organizations in improving youth participation in sports. A lot of the public attention in youth sport gets paid to the elite and travel leagues, but most research suggests it's actually you, the park districts and grassroots community sport organizations that have the largest impact on positive youth sport and elite athlete development. Current research shows the cost of having children play sports in both dollars and time tends to be the largest barrier to youth sport participation. Having children play in local park district leagues is an affordable alternative to elite travel teams. The pressure to succeed that children experience playing a sport is greatly impacted by the amount of money and time that they see their parents spending on them to play that sport. The lower the financial and time investment, the lower the pressure they experience. This lowered pressure tends to correlate with more fun and enjoyment while playing the sport. More fun and enjoyment means lowered risk of burnout, which in turn means lower dropout rates. Currently, we lose over 70% of organized sport participants by high school. When children are enjoying a sport more, they also tend to spend more time engaged in deliberate play and practice. This results in higher levels of skill development due to neuroplasticity increases and myelin production. This increase in skill and physical literacy is further enhanced when multiple sports are sampled and played, which is also encouraged at the local park district setting. Research and, well, all of the U.S. national sports governing bodies say this and not early specialization is more highly correlated with the physical literacies and diversification that leads to elite skill development and performance later in the sport journey. In fact, interviews with athletes at the highest level showed that significant differences in their practice regimens did not emerge until around age 15. This is well after those who desire the path to elite levels of performance are forced to specialize. That means that most athletes who participate in your programs are at no disadvantage in eventual elite skill development if that's the route they ultimately select for themselves. We strongly believe it's time to shift the paradigm that sports offered by community-based sport organizations are somehow second-rate. But research is also showing that can only happen if parents become educated about that research and the best practices that are being implemented around the world. That's where we at ISDI come in. We'd love to partner with you to get this information in the hands of as many sport families as possible. Please contact us and we can work with you to deliver this information and education to the sports families in your area. Thank you for your time. We hope to hear from you real soon. So, you know, that's kind of the message we're sending to our park districts so that they can reach out to the parents. Now, what do we actually, um, let's see if we can move this forward. What do we actually uh, providing the parents. It's, a, uh, it's an educational module. It's based on a platform that we have at the University of Illinois called eText. And uh, what we've done is we've structured it so that um, the, sort of the millennial parents will be able to engage with it. And uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to have time to run it, but um, what it basically is is it's uh, text, about 2,000 words uh, uh, on these various topics. Uh, it's all evidence-based. It's, it's uh, referencing 
um, uh, the research that's been done that supports the topic. It uh, has printouts uh, like you're seeing here. This is the uh, a PDF that parents can print out and take to the, uh, take to the um, events or just learn from. And uh, has interactive uh, uh, exercises the parents can do, matching stuff, that kind of thing. And um, so this is, uh, this is how we're developing and, and you know, pushing our information to um, the parents. Um, I've gotten the stop sign. One recommendation that I can just give, I really think, and Dan hit upon it, that um, we need to address this issue um, seriously. And right now, we're hamstrung by the Amateur Sports Act. The Amateur Sports Act's 40 years old, uh, and we really need to look at what um, the situation is now and make changes to the Amateur Sports Act because regardless of all the programs and all the work that's being done, without that piece of legislation overseeing what we're doing, whether it be creating a, uh, a Secretary of Sport and Ministry of Sport, um, we're really not going to go anywhere. So the one recommendation I could like to make is take a look at that as part of the strategy because it really needs to be updated and changed. Okay, thank you. Hey everyone, clap once if you can hear my voice. Clap twice, three times, last one. Um, I'm Charlie Sperdito, I'm the Senior Manager of Baseball and Softball Operations at the Nationals Academy. This is Jennifer Carlin, my boss and our Deputy Director of Programs at the Academy. Uh, show of hands, who's heard of the Nationals Youth Baseball Academy? Okay, good, some natitude in the house. So to learn and know more about it, you have to go back in, uh, in history. Uh, the historical context of the academy came about in 2005. So in 2005, Major League Baseball moved the team, uh, Montreal Expos, from Canada to DC. The city of Washington said, hey, great to have the national pastime back in the nation's capital. Uh, we'll help you build the multi-million dollar stadium just a few blocks away here on South Capitol Street. If you, the Washington Nationals, help build a youth development center in Southeast DC. So Southeast DC is um, some, consists of some of the most underserved communities of the city. In Southeast DC, 60% of high school students don't reach, don't reach graduation day, and most of that 60% uh, drop out by sophomore year. 40% of elementary school students don't achieve, or only 40% achieve passing test scores in math or science. And 40% of elementary school students are either overweight or obese. So there was a need in Southeast DC. That was back in 2005. In 2013, the academy came about. It took time to acquire the land, um, build the facility, but we opened our doors in 2013 and started programming. So we use the baseball, uh, the sports of baseball and softball as a vehicle for, um, to foster positive character development, academic achievement, and overall wellness for youth living in Anacostia, D.C., and Southeast D.C. Um, my colleague Jennifer, my boss Jennifer, is going to talk more about our holistic youth development approach um, and our core program, which is our bread and butter for third grade through eighth graders. Uh, and then I'll get back on the mic to talk about our biggest program, which is YBA Play, making ba baseball accessible um, to anyone in DC. And I should note that six years ago, I was an up to us coach, and that's how my salary was supplemented six years ago when we first opened up. The academy has gone from two full-time staff members to 32 in just six years. And Up To Us is a, a partner of ours, and we have two Up To Us coaches on our staff right now. Thanks for the great intro, Charlie. And we recognize that we are the anchor, so we're going to not take too long. We're going to I think a lot of the most important messages have already been delivered today. 
Uh, as Charlie mentioned, the core programs at the Youth Baseball Academy take place beginning in the summer of each year. Rising third graders come and join us for six weeks of summer programming, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, a part of the philosophy behind the Youth Baseball Academy is bringing together some of the key elements of learning and growth for young people to ensure that they have a positive experience with us and can learn and grow in a safe environment. I've heard the word safety and safe several times since we've been here today and want to emphasize that that's something we absolutely focus on at the Youth Baseball Academy. When the program began, when Charlie described it in 2013, we were working with three what we like to call flagship schools in the D.C. area, Ann Beers Elementary School, Kimball Elementary, and Jefferson Junior High. Um, those are all proximate to the Youth Baseball Academy, but what we've noticed is that D.C. being a city of choice, many of our parents choose to move their children out of the immediate neighborhood of the Baseball Academy out to other areas of the city, and we now have a representation of scholar athletes, which is what we call the students who come to us, of over 30 schools in Washington, D.C. And while our program is significantly smaller than some of the ones that we've heard about today, we like to think about the fact that the Youth Baseball Academy is a proof of concept of what can happen when you bring together all of the right things for young people in one place. So our key levers at the academy are not only our core academic program, and of course baseball and softball, which is the hook that we use to bring scholar athletes into us, but health and nutrition programming and family and community engagement. So scholar athletes that come to us in the summer, as I described, spend 8 a.m. to 4 p.m either on field in baseball and softball activities, in classrooms with a focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics activities. We focus through a curriculum that is called the science of sport. As you may well know, if you played baseball or softball as a young person, there are a number of mathematics and scientific concepts embedded within the game of baseball and softball. So our curriculum provides an opportunity for scholar athletes to get outside and engage in those activities and learn the mathematical and scientific concepts within. If the scholar athletes uh, are following our program the way that we would like for them to, once they're done with the six weeks in the summer, they return to us in the fall for after school programming on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from about 3.30 in the afternoon to 7 p.m. The scholar athletes that join us for that programming get help and support with their homework. They continue to work on STEM-related activities. They also have a mentoring session, which is a unique element of our programming. So we have approximately 100 mentors that are volunteers that come into the academy and work with one or two young people to provide that sense of connection that I've also heard referenced in other folks' talks today. Uh, we know that scholar athletes want to have someone to connect with on a personal level, someone who believes in them, and someone that they can feel a connection to while they're growing and developing uh, as part of our programming. After they finish their mentoring, they have enrichment activities, which range from sports-based activities to cooking and nutrition and health, to foreign language, to yoga, to one that Charlie invented called Zumball, which is a combination of baseball and Zumba. Uh, and the goal, of course, is to keep children active and engaged in what's going on at the academy. They have their supper with us, and then they're on their way home at the end of the evening. Again, the thing that I want to emphasize about our core programming is that it ties a number of things that we as educators and as sports-based youth developers understand to be pertinent. They have opportunities for socialization, to connect in a positive way with their peers, to make significant relationships with adults who care about them, and to figure out ways to make good choices about nutrition and their health holistically. Uh, we feel that this is a proof of concept for what you can do again in one space in terms of the development of young people. And we feel really proud that although 80% of the children that come through the doors of the Youth Baseball Academy have never touched a baseball or a softball or been on a ball field before, they learn who they are as athletic people and they learn to appreciate the power of athletics and sports in their lives. So I'm gonna turn the mic back over to Charlie, who's gonna talk a little bit more about YBA play, YBA hustle, and the baseball and softball work that we do in more depth at the academy. I wanted to share a factoid. Um, in 1949, there are more African-Americans on the Brooklyn Dodgers World Series team than there were in 2018. Um, you know, YBA play, 
makes baseball accessible to anyone. And we have changed the game to modernize it for this new generation notification. Uh, we are on the front lines of growing the game of baseball. And YBA Play, which I'll talk about right now, if the slides move, um, is a free program, year-round program, for kids living in Ward 7 and Ward 8. But it's highlighted by a summer league in four different wards in the in the Washington D.C. So I mentioned we were modernizing the game to make it fun. So what does that what does that look like? I played baseball growing up. Um, I played through college and one year professionally. Um, it's a boring game. There are times where it's <laughs> slow. Um, I would start chasing butterflies in the outfield or picking clover. Uh, if you know, I wasn't engaged with the game or if there was another pitching change. Uh, so YBA play is for six to 12 year olds. Um, we use modified rules to promote a fast pace of play. Um, we always say if kids don't hit, they quit. Um, our modified rules include no outs. You'll see a video where I explain this more, but we don't use outs with our instructional league in YBA play. If children get on or off the field, in eight seconds or less, then they're awarded another batter, a sixth batter. If their dugout is positive, engaged, and, and cheering on their teammates, uh, they're awarded a seventh batter. And we don't use umpires. We use field coordinators, uh, trained coaches, who moderate the pace of play, um, who pause the game if there's a teaching moment, uh, but who is always on the kids, uh, you, know, you know, encouraging them to, to hustle. So we, we value effort over outcomes, effort over outcomes. Um, YBA Play was started in 2014, right after we got the core program started, to maximize our impact uh, and to reach more children in the DC community. We squarely focus on you know, recruitment in lower income communities. Um, transportation is a barrier, but our locations are in different strategic sites of the city to maximize participation. We started with 40 scholar athletes. We're up to over 800 kids now uh, in 2018, or 2019, I should say. Uh, our goal is to have 1,000 participants come uh, this July. Um, our secret sauce is our coaches. So we, we recruit a, an army of volunteer coaches. And preceding this season in June, we have a required training module that our coaches have to go through, from a leadership training, to a trauma-sensitive training, uh, to bridging cultural divides training, and of course, to a baseball X's and O's training. So when people think, oh, I can't volunteer for the Nationals Academy, that, that's elite level baseball. We are community building. We just use baseball as the vehicle. If we can't teach enthusiasm, we can't to, uh, you know, teach someone who's heavily involved with the community, we can teach how to catch, how to throw, especially for a six and seven year old. Um, so the three, the three E's, energy, enthusiasm, and effort, that's what we look for when we, when we recruit coaches. And then we require them to go through our, our training module before they hit the field with our kids. So last year was a, uh, a monumental achievement for us. Um, because of YBA play, the evolution of YBA play, and where we are as an academy, we've reached a stage of our growth where we've created travel teams without the travel and more competitive ball teams. Uh, and that's called YBA Hustle. So YBA Play is feeding the funnel, um, trying to get anyone who wants to put on a glove and put on a jersey to play. And then YBA Hustle is our more competitive teams that play at our academy. Last year, our Hustle team which then became the local all-star team, won the local Little League championship. So the first time in the 33-year existence of Washington, D.C. Little League, a team from Ward 7 won the championship. And our kids got to go to Bristol, Connecticut and play on ESPN, and uh, we had a party for them. So in just five years, through creating YBA Play and this opportunity, um, we've gotten to see success on the field. It wasn't our, our goal. Our goal is to create community leaders, college graduates, 
we think we'll, we'll build you know, pro players and college baseball players by default, but it's really community building, effort over outcomes, teaching to the process. Here's one example of uh, YBA play. Over half of these children, Jennifer mentioned, had never touched a baseball before coming to the academy. Our, um, our community coaching cohort ranges from Howard University students to retired FBI agents to retired baseball players. So the kids get it to engage with a diverse group of adults, which is important. As you see so far, this is data from 2018. The majority of our recruitment efforts are in Ward 7 and Ward 8. However, we're extending into Ward 5 and Ward 6. Another best practice of ours is the personal relationship the children get to uh, build with our coaches. So we always have a seven to one coach to kid ratio. This is important when you're teaching kids who have never played the game before. You want coaches right there to be able to give them instruction immediately. And that coach to kid ratio helps promote a fast pace of play, maximizes activity, less waiting, less lines. By 2021, we hope to have well over 1,000 kids participating in YBA play. So this is our strategic plan for the next two years. In this video, which I'll let them play, we'll give you a visual sense of what the program is about. YBA Play is open to anyone who wants to put on a glove and put on a jersey. It's accessible to anyone. You don't have to have any experience playing Little League or baseball. We set up modified rules to make the game more accessible. Our modified rules include no outs. We don't play outs. We have five batters and switch. If the kids get on or off the field in six seconds or less, we award that team a sixth batter. If a team's dugout is loud and positive, we'll award that team a seventh batter. We want to emphasize positivity and hustle. We're giving teams a competitive advantage to play the academy way. When my mom put me in softball, I really loved it because I got to be outside and do things that I love. And then when I was introduced to baseball this year, I loved it a lot. I made some friends and the coaches are very nice. They helped me learn uh, some, some new things, some things I didn't know, some things I need to work on, and they helped me with that. And it was, it, it was enjoyable. It's been fun because y'all had fun activities and y'all helped me not be a pool hitter and be an all around hitter. We have nearly 50 coaches volunteering their time to help produce YBA play in our summer league. They're special because of their diversity. We have 17-year-old kids who play high school baseball and softball who want to come out and help out. And we have retirees who used to play baseball. We have police officers, teachers. It's a great, diverse, eclectic group. And it's special that our, our children here at the academy get exposed to those adults. I have two young kids myself, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to mature as a dad and to give back overall. The word opportunity, it just stands out to me the most. Uh, allowing kids to grow. Uh, giving them something else to see and to do. And you just never know what uh, YBA could do for a child or for a youth growing up. So to me, it's very special, and I think that YBA is very important and doing an excellent job in the community. It's just been a very positive experience for me, knowing that um, I'm like impacting younger kids, you know, everyday lives, whether it's playing catch for a couple minutes or, you know, having a little conversation with them, like, and showing them what a leader is supposed to be and how to have fun the right way. What would I say to a parent that is thinking about signing a kid up here at the academy? I would say go for it. It's a good environment, it's safe, and it teaches baseball as well as physical fitness, nutrition, and like the science of sports and other life skills that they probably can use. Here at the academy, we use baseball 
as a vehicle to foster character development, academic enrichment, and overall wellness for children. And we want to expand YBA play to each ward of the city and use baseball to bridge cultural divides. It's a special thing to see that the culture of baseball being built and kids really falling in love with the game. All right, we want to keep our commitment to get you out one time. Um, so does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Oh, I see a hand. Hi, Risa from Kaboom. Um, I was struck, uh, Dave, you mentioned this, and then uh, Charlie and um, Jennifer, you also mentioned uh, baseball and softball, and, and Dave, you mentioned the importance of gender inclusivity. And um, I'm wondering if either, you know, both of you, you know, all three of you or everyone on the stage, whoever feels like they can chime in, could talk about um, co-ed sports or mixed gender sports and what the appropriate time is for that, what, you know, kind of this question around inclusivity and also um, sometimes finding perhaps powerful spaces and single gender um, experiences in sport. So, what are you seeing as best practices or what are your experiences and how you're doing that um, through gender? Um, what we're finding in the research is that uh, boys and girls, for most part, can play together um, up until 10, 11, 12 years old, until uh, peak, height, peak height velocity, which is basically puberty. And um, that uh, when they do play together, there's more, I guess, an understanding of, uh, Working together as a team and um, and not being you know separate, not boys versus girls, uh, but they're they're players, they're athletes. So uh, I think we're going to be promoting in our uh, pr uh, modules that uh, parents look at programs that uh, that permit that and encourage that in the future. You didn't mention my name, but I will chime in on that. So. <laughs> Perfect. So um, typically at the YMCA, we'll see co-ed leagues up through second grade. Um, depending upon the demographics of the community that's being served, we may see um, co-ed teams extend beyond that. Certainly at the Y, we're a firm believer of um, inclusion. And so whatever team you want to play on, we're certainly open to. And so um, as kids do develop um, to, to that point, um, you know, we do see some separation with, with older youth, but we certainly um, do not exclude based upon that. And so we like to leave it up to the kids, but most YMCA's starting at that third grade level will start to, to have that separation. We have co-ed teams up until 12 years old. Um, so we have a, a 13U hustle softball team, and then the the DC Little League champions are on the big field now. They're a 13 new team, but we don't do it until, or separate until 12 years old. And a lot of that has to do with middle school softball teams. Uh, we wanna make sure they're set up for success for that. And so we support them. And the only thing that I would add is that, again, one of the things about our unique situation at the academy, which is just up the road, by the way, in case anybody wants a field trip at the end of the evening, because we're going back for programming. Um, is that we create other opportunities for the young people to be together off the field, right? So while they're not playing in the same baseball game or the same softball game, we host community conversations every night at dinner where grade level groups are together having dialogue around pertinent issues that all of them are struggling with or thinking about or challenged with such that they recognize this space is about sports and us being athletes together, but it's also about us learning together as well. Any, any other questions? Uh, and this may be our last one. Oh, sorry. What time is it? No, that's okay. Go okay. ahead. Uh, you guys, how do you share uh, the best practices that emerge from whether it's a park or a Y or, um, I mean, you at the Nationals, that's, that's an example, that academy for the entire MLB and U.S. soccer. Like, so when something amazing happens, we're all trying to figure out how to share it with a country, but you have big networks. How do you share it? within your own networks? What's the best way to say, we did this? 
and it works. Uh, well, for our part, a U.S. Youth Soccer, as I mentioned, we have a, a pretty large footprint of, of member state associations, and we've created a, uh, a shared environment uh, on our technology platform that allows us to collect success stories from our state associations. Um, the, the other thing we uh, have been very successful at doing is convening our members together uh, to share best practices and stories uh, at learning summits and you know conventions that we, we host and that allows for a lot of cross-pollination among our membership. Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Manfred has um, said we're the gold standard of academies, which is a pretty special comment. We're unique. There are only other eight other urban academies across the country. We're special because we start at six years old. We don't start at 14 years old, and we're not geared towards player development. We're geared towards youth development. We know the game that we're playing is a marathon, not a sprint, and we're going to be in Southeast DC for years to come. We're not trying to win championships you know, the next year. So it's, it's constant message bombardment to MLB saying this is the right process, community building, using, using baseball as a vehicle, because at least we are creating lifelong fans of Major League Baseball and the Nationals and creating a safe, structured youth sports environment. For us at the Y, we like to um, think of ourselves as uh, a convening organization and a collaborating organization. We do that with each other um, through our national resource office. We just started our, created our new intranet called Link, where it's a much more social platform to be able to share information amongst YMCAs. But for us as a YMCA, the most important piece is that kids and families and seniors, adults are all being impacted in a very dramatic way. And so what that looks like in various communities throughout this country is very different. Uh, we partner with you know, uh, many organizations to be able to impact uh, the folks that we serve. And so how that looks is different, but information sharing is extremely important. And we're certainly more than open to the collaborative nature and convening nature um, that we have an opportunity, especially here, um, sitting with everyone. So panelists, thank you. It was very interesting to hear about in what you're doing at the national, state, and local level. I might take a field trip. Um, so thank you very much, and you can go down if you'd like. Uh, Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense.